Perhaps the most difficult question to answer when trying to describe classical Lutheran education is this. <clears throat> understand what Lutheran education is, I understand what education education is, but what is classical education? Think about that for a second. What is classical education? How would you, or how do you, when you're talking with your relatives or your friends or others who have an interest in what you have chosen either as your vocation or as the mode by which you are going to uh, educate your children, how do you describe this? Well, let's see. There's the, the well, there's the trivium. There's grammar and logic and, and, and rhetoric. And, and we name stuff after that, grammar and logic and rhetoric. Oh, and there's a Paul Parrot. There's Pert. What was the other one? Um, all right. And then there's, oh, there's, uh, there's some laws, seven laws, I think, about, about teaching. Oh, and Latin. We do Latin. And um, we do Latin a lot, actually. <laughs> like with really little kids. Um, and there's a trivium. We, there's a trivium. <laughs> we do that. Have you ever had that conversation? <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds like my, uh, when, when we started Faith Christian School in Roanoke, Virginia in 1996, that's a lot, that sounds a lot like my first couple of open houses when we're trying to convince people to entrust their children to a school that didn't actually exist and we couldn't describe for them exactly what it was all going to be about. But no, just trust us, pay your, pay your tuition and send your kid and it's all gonna be fine. We promise, we promise, because it's a really, really, really good idea. It is, it is. That's where we find ourselves sometimes, I know. Um, it's, it's a little different now, perhaps, I hope, um, you know, 20 or 30 years in, depending on how old your school is or how long you've been involved with classical schooling. But what we have a tendency to describe when we're asked the question or when, we're, when we, are, we are faced with the challenge of, of defining classical education, we have a tendency to, to, um, to uh, go to features the things we do, the, the, the characteristics of the process and the environment and the, the, the things that we engage children with and the unique elements um, or the, 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 the unique uh, as, um, the unique as, uh, elements that we, that we teach those things. So what I wanna do is I want to talk more about the heart the heart of classical education. It's, it's about why we do this. And if it all works out the, 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 way that we, that, the way that we hope, what might be some of the results in the lives of our children and in the, in the life of the world that our children will, will inhabit? I wanna go back, not all the way to the beginning, but I wanna start about 4,000 years ago in the calling of Abraham and, and God's divine choice of a people that he was going to teach, he was going to draw to himself and teach them a divine civilization. Let's start, let's start there, the divine civilization. The Hebrews, as, as much as they were like the, uh, the people around them in the ancient Near East, were by the time, by, uh, by, by the time uh, of, the, of the exodus and the wandering in the wilderness emerged a very, very unique civilization, very, very unique society. And for our purposes today, 
I want to point out just uh, four things that were unique about the Hebrews and and the the effect that God that 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 they, that God had in their lives individually and and as a people that have some application to us today and our efforts to craft schools and to teach our, our children. And the first is this. The first is this, that the Hebrews were people of the book. People of the book. God gave them what he wanted them to know about him in words. And he instructed them to write them down. He didn't just say it and, 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 and tell them to preserve an oral history. He, he said, write these things down so that they will be transmitted from generation to generation. And research just conducted in the last couple of decades confirms that somewhere around the time of Isaiah, about seven to 800 BC in that, in that neighborhood, some around the, that rates of literacy in certain parts of, of Israel were astronomically higher than any place else in the whole Near East. People actually were being taught how to read. People who weren't priests and aristocrats and poets, people were being taught how to read in obedience to God's instructions to his people to be people of the book and to learn the law and the words that God had given them. A second thing, I couldn't help it, sorry. <laughs> He's the best Moses ever. The second thing is that the law that God gave to his people is based uniquely in love. There was no other law, Hammurabi or anyone else, whose basic motivate, who's the, the, for whom the law was basically motivated by love. A law that was guided by love for God, but also love for others. The responsibility handed to God's people in the law was a responsibility both for ourselves, but also for our neighbors. And not just the neighbors we know, the neighbors we don't know, the aliens, the immigrants, the people who come into our, into our civilization, into our society. And the law said, love them, love them. The third thing, a third thing, is that the Hebrew society and religion and rites of worship were based on two complementary, two complementary values. On the one hand, on the one hand, you had the collective sacrifice, collective sacrificial system. The responsibility for all of God's people to gather at certain times in order to offer sacrifices for the atonement of the nation. Now, the notion of atonement all by itself was entirely unique theologically, but I'm not going to go there right now. The point is, though, that when we all gathered together, there was a communal responsibility. We had a communal standing before God. And, and, we also had an individual standing before God. Think about David's psalm, his prayer in Psalm 51. According to your loving kindness, Father, have mercy on my sin-forsaken soul. Just me. Just me. Against you only have I sinned, he said. So we have the, this communal gathering, this communal rituals, these communal rituals that God calls us to, and we also have this privilege of an individual recognition by God for each individual person within the community of the people of God. And then there's a fourth thing, again, unique and sort of unexpected, frankly. So when Jeremiah was 
predicting what was about to happen to God's disobedient people, the stiff-necked people. I love all of the adjectives that Jeremiah uses to describe God's people. None of them are flattering, you notice. None of them are flattering at all. But he says, when you get taken to that place, what does he tell them to do? Pray for the good of that place. So they get carted off, Jerusalem's torn to the ground, they get carted off to Babylon, the ultimate symbol, ultimate symbol in the ancient world of godlessness and paganism and cruelty and all of the other things that the Babylonian empire represented. And he said, pray for the good of that city because when that city prospers, you will prosper as well. That comes kind of out of the blue. I mean, what kind of a God tells his people, I'm punishing you by taking you to this awful place. And oh, by the way, once you get there, care for it. Love it. Follow the law as I've given it to you on behalf of the good of that place. So why do I go there? Because there's an intersection here. Because just about a hundred years after Jerusalem is torn to the ground, the Persian emperor, Darius, this is the best picture I could find of him. He's wrestling a lion, um, which I don't know. He had a thing for lions. Who worked for Darius? Daniel. Right. Earlier, certainly in his career, I don't think he was alive by the time, by the time of Darius' adventures uh, eastward. But here's Darius looking enviously, jealously toward the east. He wants to expand his empire. And so he marches his army in 490 BC, or, yeah, 490 BC, eastward toward the Greek Peloponnes Peloponnesus. And the Greeks know he's coming, of course. And so they gather an army of basically farmers and shepherds and, and uh, whoever else. They, they weren't all that terribly organized uh, militarily. And they go out, and against all odds, they defeat the Persian army at the Battle of... Right from which we all get the bumper stickers that we put on the back of our SUVs. This is the one that goes on mine. The Battle of, Battle of Marathon, this, this miracle of military history, these farmers and shopkeepers defeat the, the greatest army in the world at the time. So Darius retreats back to Persia, licks his wounds, and he's succeeded by a guy named Xerxes. Xerxes, by the way, happened to have conscripted into his harem a Jewish woman named Esther. You're starting to see the confluence here, right? The overlaps. I just think it's so cool that when we read the history of God's people in the scriptures, it's like real history. <laughs> My wife tells me that when she grew up in Sunday school, she thought that Bible world was like another world, someplace else that on a different planet almost, and that it wasn't really the same thing as the world that, that we inhabit. But of course, all of these things come together. And so Xerxes decides he's gonna take another whack at the pinata, and he's going to head east again and see whether he can't absorb the, the eastern part of the Mediterranean, eastern, or, yeah, he's going to go west, whether he can't absorb the eastern part of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean into, his, um, into his empire. And he nearly succeeds. So this time, 
He gets through Thermopylae, we know that from the movie, right? Um, and the hunchback who betrays the, who, who, uh, betrays the Spartans. He makes his way all the way down, gets to Athens, takes it, burns it to the ground. It looks like it's curtains for the Greeks. But then, another miracle of history, his entire armada gets destroyed in the Bay of Salamis. Because the Athenians, between the time that of the, the victory at Salamis and the time 10 years later, had learned how to sail, not just to sail, but how to fight on the water. They had built a navy and that was their saving grace. And the Persian army sinks to the bottom of the bay and Xerxes is actually sitting on the dais watching over, overlooking, watching the battle, and he realizes this is it. And he runs back to Persia, and that's it. The Persians never come back again until the Ottoman Empire. So why is that important? It's important because it allowed for what I'll call the rise of the free peoples. And it spawned what we know as the golden age of Greece, or the Athenian, the Athenian Empire. And it didn't last very long. Remember the, 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 the Greece that we think of, the, all of the literature and the democracy and the commerce and the empire building, all of that, it happened pretty much within the space of about 100 years. Didn't, didn't last very long at all. But the impression that was left, indelible, absolutely indelible. And so what characterized, what characterized this rise of the free peoples? Well, first of all, the notion of a dialectician, of a contemplative philosopher whose role in society was to think <laughs> like that's a job. For the first time in the history of the world, people were, there was a vocation to think and to think about important things, not just to like figure stuff out, not just to invent stuff, not just to, you know, build a STEM program, but to think about virtue and to think about human nature and to think about what are the things that make us most human? What are the things that make us most like we were designed to be? They also came up with a system of justice which lives in some part to this very day. Now, if you don't know about how the Greek legal system works, it's important to understand, especially if you are a classical Christian, uh, classical Lutheran school educator. So the way it worked was this. So if you were a white male landowning, uh, property owning, you were automatically a citizen in the polis. And as a citizen in the polis in Athens, you had certain responsibilities, one of which was to help to adjudicate laws, because in the, the Greek legal system, uh, everyone was responsible to represent themselves. So if I had a problem with my neighbor trespassing or they felt like I was being cheated in business or something, it was my responsibility to personally prosecute that person under the law. There weren't no attorneys. I couldn't hire someone to do it for me. I had the responsibility to do it. And I would do it in front of a jury of my peers, other members of the polis, and, the, and they would hear the case and then they would vote on the case. They would adjudicate and determine who was right and who was wrong under, under the law. Now, this is a lot of responsibility for busy people. And it started to occur to some Athenians that maybe there should be some kind of preparation for these types of responsibilities. And so they started schools and they hired people called rhetors to teach their children, their young boys, how to represent themselves rhetorically in the courts. And that's, that's where we get the very beginning of what would become the liberal arts. The first schools were rhetorical schools, 
schools designed to help people represent themselves, free people represent themselves before the law and before, and before their peers. Now, you can imagine that a system like this, as, ideal, as idealistic as it sounds, could be beset with problems. It's not perfect. Right, just like any legal system isn't perfect. And it sort of symbolically demonstrates how imperfect it is, excuse me, in 399 BC, which marks the death of whom? Socrates. So within this imperfect system, which puts so much emphasis on the education of the young in order to fulfill their responsibilities as free people, corruption still can creep in, and bias, and injustice. In 399 BC, Socrates, having been convicted by a jury of 500 of his peers, rather than accept the, the verdict of exile, volunteers for his own execution. And what happens then, what happens then is that the Athenian Empire essentially begins to collapse in on itself. And there's an implosion. Democracy starts to go away. People stop trusting the, the, the rhetors. They start calling them sophists. And, they, and, and, they, uh, and the Athenians themselves elect tyrants to rule them rather than having the responsibility of ruling themselves as free, as free people. So there's an implosion. But at the same time, there's sort of an explosion of Greek ideas and Greek culture, which we call what we call the Hellenic civilization, all over the Mediterranean world. And even though the Greeks are eventually replaced geopolitically by the Romans, the Roman civilization, at least culturally and literarily and artistically, and the things that we remember about Greek civilization or Roman civilization are essentially Greek. They're the ideas, the, 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 and the ideals. Now, I know that Dr. Heck would be here, and so I have to just say something about my favorite Chronicle of Narnia. At some point in my, in my 20s, um, the horse and his boy replaced the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe in my little canon as my favorite Chronicle of Narnia, partly because I was studying this idea of the, the, the conflicts between East and West, between Persia and Greece, and, and, and thinking about the long-term implications of what would society have been like? What would Europe have been like had the Persians succeeded? Think about that. We would be very, very different people sitting here today. We wouldn't be sitting here today, likely. Not like this. Not doing these things. Not thinking about these matters. Not planning the way that we're planning for our children and, and for their futures. And I realized that the horse and his boy, which is the only of the Chronicles of Narnia which doesn't actually take place in Narnia, is really kind of a metaphor for the this, this, this survival of Western ideas over against what, what then what would have been considered Near, Near Eastern ideas. Because the Near, Near Eastern characters in, uh, in The Horse and His Boy um, are ruled by a king, but everyone is subservient to the king. There is no individualism, there is no freedom, there is no personal responsibility. All responsibility is owed to the semi-deific semi figure, just like Xerxes and Darius presented themselves. And the animals are dumb. They can't talk. They're not free. And even the Narnian animals who happen to be captured and taken to this other kingdom once, if they're there long enough, they, they forget that they're free and they forget how to talk. 
until another Narnian boy who's captured and kidnapped and realizes that he's not really from this place and he needs to find his way back someplace, engages a Narnian horse and who remembers how to talk. And then the adventure begins on their way back to freedom and individual responsibility and, and lives of communal virtue rather than that single responsibility to a deific figure. And so, as the Western civilization coalesces, all of a sudden what happens? Enter the Christ child. And we've thought about this before. You've heard sermons about this before. How amazing it is in God's providence that the world was arranged the way it was at the point at which Jesus enters, enters human history as a child, as a boy, and as a man, and how, how, how ideally situated the world was to have the, have the message of the gospel, Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension, have it spread by the apostles all over the known world the civilized world, if, or if, if, as it was understood back then. But something else happened in those early years, in the apostolic years. There was a certain new kind of hero, not a Greek hero, not necessarily a Hebrew type of hero. A new type of heroism was established by the Christian martyrs. Christian martyrs who sacrificed themselves obedient to death, not for the sake of themselves or the, for the sake of glory or the sake of being remembered, but for the sake of their savior. Louise Cowan calls this the humble hero. It's a con convergence from the apostolic age and into the early, early, into the early church of what she calls the courage of the heroic Greek and the humility of the poetic Hebrews coming together in the person of Christ and in the, and in the um, apostolic age and in the identification of heroism in, in martyrdom. Which leads us to a new kind of civilization what we can call Christendom, or what we can call just Western civilization. It's not uncontroversial, am I right? The idea that we would even refer to, let alone celebrate Christendom as Western civilization in the days, in the age in which we live is unpopular, to put it one way, unpopular. But it's important to remember. So what did Christendom essentially consist of? What were, what were the convergences that came together? And then I'm going I'm to give you a very simple, s overly simplistic sketch. But at least these four things help to, to form the shape of Christendom and Western, and Western civilization. The first is the enlightenment, the divine enlightenment of the Hebrews, the people of the book. They were the ones to whom God revealed himself in words, in law. They were the ones whom God formed as a society, a living civilization in the world, amongst other civilizations with responsibilities both for themselves and for their neighbors. And they had it right. The Greeks had a lot of things wrong, right? They had, they had, they, they, they had good instincts, but they got a lot of things wrong. The Hebrews knew what was true because God had told them. 
I created the world, and this is how I did it, and this is why I did it, and this is where you fit in to the world that I created, and this is your purpose. And they could say that confidently because they knew it was true. The second are the Greek ideals. This idea that man was created, man was formed for something beyond himself. And that there are, in fact, virtues and vices, and they're real categories, and they matter. There is, in fact, beauty and not beauty. That's not very popular today, is it? Is beauty in the eye of the beholder? Not according to the Greeks, not according to the Bible. So they had a lot of things right, and they were able to idealize these notions, and they were able to transmit the notions in ways that no other civilization has done in literature and in art and in architecture. And then we have Roman forms. They liked to tidy things up, these Romans. They liked things, they liked lists, they liked structure, they liked process, they liked predictability. And they followed their laws, at least for most of the empire, they followed their laws fairly well and predictably and sensibly. And then finally, we have this Christian synthesis. We have the apostolic age and we have the early church fathers who start to pull all of these strands together and, 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 and pull them into what, will, what would become the most notable civilization in the history of the world. And I think it's fair to say, though it's also unpopular to, to say. Embodied by individuals but by no one more than this individual, St. Augustine, who lived in a tragic time. We think of St. Augustine, I think, sometimes as sort of this, this uh, transcendental character because the reformers referenced him and sort of took his worldview and, and brought it forward into the space of the Reformation and, and and use what, what, what uh, Augustine drew from the scriptures as a platform. But he lived, he lived in a very troubling time. He lived to see Rome sacked, 410 AD. And then he lived to see Romans all over the, all over the empire blame Christians for the fall of Rome and spent the last few years of his life, last decade and a half or so of his life, furiously, furiously arguing for the Christian faith over against the accusation that it was in fact the Christian faith that had caused the downfall of the greatest empire on earth to that point, to that point. But he embodied this Western civilization, this, this, this synthesis of Hebrew enlightenment and Greek ideals and Roman, Roman forms and, and, and a Christian worldview and civilization. And so now leap forward another 1,100 years. I like how Joseph Fiennes looks startled in this picture. <laughs> The synthesis had unraveled to some extent. It had corrupted, it had been corrupted, and it was in need of repair. And it wasn't just ecclesiastical repair that was needed, it was societal repair, it was governmental repair. There were lots of things that were falling apart that even though Martin Luther and, and his the dynamic duo, they didn't intend to fix society. I mean, that wasn't really where they, where they started, but they ended up in many ways, quote unquote, fixing society, repairing the ruins, if you will, 
or at least beginning the repair of those ruins, ruins. and they did it based on, they did their work theologically, educationally, and otherwise based on the platform of that Christian synthesis. The platform of that integrated understanding of the world that drew on these different strands, some divine, some some divinely obvious and, and revelatory, some generally revel revelatory and providential. They 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 reached back and they pulled things together and they said, This is how we need to live. This is how we need to order ourselves. This is this is what society needs to be based on. And I'll just highlight what I think are four contributions, just four, that Luther and Melanchthon and others made, excuse me, to modern education that are useful to us today. The first is the idea that it is a family's primary responsibility to teach and to raise children in the faith. I mean, that's what this whole conference is about, isn't it? That's why you picked the hymns you picked this morning, right? That's why you picked the scriptures that we read this morning. Did you say, did I hear you say, if the family breaks, society breaks? family, church, society. It's all connected. It's all linked together. And Luther did that for us. He relinked it all together. And he said, we're going to start at home and we're going to make it a parent's responsibility to teach and to raise and to disciple and to catechize their children. The church will contribute, but if parents don't do it first, then there's a, there's a fundamental failure happening. Secondly, their educational vision was remarkably ecumenical and democratized. Everyone needed to learn how to read. Boys, girls, poor, rich. You didn't have to be an aristocrat to get an education in the environment of the Reformation. As a matter of fact, all you needed to do was be born. And society was responsible to edu educate you. And, and the third thing that Luther does is he connects education to the state so that there is resources and an enforcement po uh, possibility so that people, in a, in a sense, must be educated. It's not optional. We're all going to learn how to read. We're all going to be able to read our Bibles. We're all going to be able to teach our children. We are all going to be able to conduct ourselves in government. We're all going to be able to conduct ourselves literally, lit literally in business. We're all going to be able to occupy vocations that require us to use our minds and not just our hands and our backs. All of that together. And then the fourth thing is they did a really nice job, an expert job of reaching back to ancient forms like the trivium and, and making, them, made the, making them work in the 16th century and following. There weren't rhetorical responsibilities like in ancient Greece. There weren't the same sort of, sort of princely responsibilities for the average person that required a lot of logic and philosophy like there had been in the medieval period. The grammar was important, but Luther and Melanchthon allowed that if you couldn't find a Latin teacher, learn your grammar in German. That's fine. The point is, you need to know grammar because grammar matters. And if you can learn it in Latin, that's great too. Maybe even, even better. But they were practical and they understood limitations, but they knew how to take things like the trivium and apply them to the present and make them relevant and to make them work for the benefit of people as they needed it. So what is the heart of classical Lutheran education? What is it? 
What are we doing here? I'm going to say it's very quickly six things. First of all, everything has a divine origin, and absolutes are absolutes. We find that consistently through the stream of history that we've been discussing. We believe in the constancy of human nature. We're all made in God's image, and we're all the same all the time. Someone born 4,000 years ago is exactly in their essence and in their person like someone who is born today, exactly like someone who will be born in another 4,000 years or another 4 million years, it doesn't matter. And our lives would be set with tragedy because the image of God in us is not yet perfected. It needs work, it needs, sa it needs saving, it needs redeeming. And then the rules of the law, both God's law and man's law and of the gospel. Nobody can live up to the law, so we need the gospel. But if we don't have the law, then we don't have an orderly society. So we need, them, we need them both. We need them both. And then personal responsibility, my individual standing before God and the grace that God shares to me individually, but also supplies to me through a community that, communal, that, that together stands before God and is responsible to order itself as a society. Literacy. And the idea that literacy leads us toward ideals of humility and even heroism, because we need both. We need heroes. We need people who will stand up for things that are right and true and just. And we need people those same people to be walking humbly with God. And then finally, the motivation for progress. It starts with God's law of love. It ends or it consummates with the capabilities that we have gathered over time to benefit others to do good for others, to cure cancers, to feed people, to end wars, to fight wars when, they're, when it's necessary, to pursue progress, to pray for the good of the nation, even a nation that despises us sometimes, to pursue the common good. So what is the heart of classical Lutheran education? I'll sum it up in one declarative sentence. Christian civilization must be taught. And that's why we're here. Thank you.